ਜਿਹੜੇ ਉੱਥੇ ਸੀਗੇ ਤੇ ਉੱਥੇ ਨਾ ਕੀ ਕਰਦੇ ਉਹ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਉਹ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਵੀ ਪੈਸ ਲੈ ਲੈਂਦੇ ਉਹ ਸਾਰਾ ਸਾਰਾ ਤੇ ਦੋਨੋਂ ਦਾ ਰਿਸ਼ਤਾ ਹੀ ਖਤਮ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਅਸਲਾਮ ਅਲੈਕਮ ਗੁੱਡ ਮਾਰਨਿੰਗ ਬੀਇੰਗ ਦਾ ਫਰਸਟ ਸਪੀਕਰ ਇਜ਼ ਆਲਵੇਸ ਅ ਫਨ ਥਿੰਗ ਟੂ ਡੂ ਆਈ ਵਾਸ ਜਸਟ ਰਿਮਾਈਂਡਡ ਥੈਟ ਵੀ ਹੈਵ 45 ਮਿੰਟਸ ਟੂ ਕਵਰ ਆਲ ਆਫ ਅਸ ਸੋ ਆਮ ਗੋਇੰਗ ਟੂ ਟ੍ਰਾਈ ਐਂਡ ਮੇਕ ਸ਼ੋਰ ਆਮ ਵੈਰੀ ਬ੍ਰੀਫ ਆਮ ਗੋਇੰਗ ਟੂ ਮੇਕ ਸ਼ੋਰ ਆਈ ਜਸਟ ਸ਼ੇਅਰ ਵਿਦ ਯੂ ਅ ਫਿਊ ਥਿੰਗਸ ਟੂ ਪੌਂਡਰ ਓਵਰ ਰਾਦਰ ਥੈਨ ਗਿਵ ਯੂ ਅ ਸਪੀਚ ਸੋ ਮਾਈ ਅਪੋਲੋਜੀਜ਼ ਟੂ ਯੂ ਥੇਰ ਇਜ਼ ਨੋ ਸਪੀਚ ਬਟ ਸਮ ਆਈਡੀਆਸ ਟੂ ਡਿਸਕਸ ਐਂਡ ਥਿੰਕ ਅਬਾਊਟ ਮਾਈ ਨੇਮ ਇਜ਼ ਸਗੀਰ ਆਈ I'm going to talk to you about digital which has not much to do with the topic that was discussed earlier on but I hope you will see why it's relevant to today's world I hope you'll see why we need to talk about it in the context of anything we think about including defense security um you can see that in short time a lot can happen today in one minute 18 million text messages go around the world believe it or not in one minute a million logins happen on facebook so a minute is a lot of time now and the reason that's very important to understand is that we need to start thinking about digital faster than we are as a community and a country and a group digital is moving very fast and if countries don't think about it there will be consequences of that and that's my hypothesis which i'm going to share with you over the next few minutes the first thing that i would like to share with you is what is it because there's a lot of confusion about digital a lot of people think about digital as the physical attributes of digital in the physical attributes of digital they're enablers but that's not what digital is about so we need to figure out what is digital in the physical attributes people talk about the number of mobile phones in a country internet connections people talk about what number of services we are buying from them uh, the numbers are pretty interesting there uh, there are countries where over a trillion dollars of trade now happens on uh, digital if you look at e-commerce the countries which are just starting like pakistan and we are already doing 600 million dollars of trade on e-commerce and it's a very new phenomena in pakistan internet connections again in a country like pakistan with their resource limitations which we are trying to overcome we have 50 million connections in a population of 200 yes there are other countries with that close to hitting a billion connections so to me physical attributes are not necessarily how you measure digital and i think that's one thing we need to become very clear about then there's some formal definitions like there's a society for uh, telecommunication worldwide and they claim that digital is about the transformation triggered by massive adoption of digital technology now what the hell does that mean i honestly don't know the nice words from some dictionary to me that's too vague so the first thing to understand is why digital is moving fast and we need to adopt the second thing is what is it in that my first submission is do not go by the physical attributes if you don't go by the physical attributes then one other way to look at it is who are the players in it maybe we look at them and try to understand something if you look at the players in the world they're changing very fast just look at which were the companies which dominated the world a few years ago 20 years ago oil companies pharmaceuticals banks this is a slide which tells you the market value of each of those companies and look at who dominates the world today and by what scale and size none of those companies which were at the top 20 years ago are there anymore exons city ge walmart at the peak were about half a billion 500 billion so half a trillion two companies crossed a trillion in value just in the last few weeks who are those two companies they are both digital right thank you sir both start with a apple and amazon so these are the players who are emerging and the take away from this is in this fast moving world companies 
which don't adopt get left behind. And I submit to you, countries which don't adopt will get left behind also. And they will get left behind by a huge margin. So it's important we start understanding digital and what role it plays. So what, if it's not the size of the companies, if it's not the companies, if it's not the physical attributes, what's digital? Okay, let's start talking a little bit about it. I think there are some key attributes to look at. We have gone from a time frame of production, whether it was in the factory line, in the agriculture, mineral coming out of the ground, being important to the digital age, where what's important is click satisfaction. What's click satisfaction? It's how fast, how easily you can get to what you want in terms of information, transaction, execution of the transaction, and management of the transaction. It can be for a bank, it can be for a retail store, it can be for a pharmaceutical, it can be in any industry. It's the click satisfaction. Second thing is, it's 24-7, anytime, anywhere. Third, its impact is across borders. Despite all the discussions we are hearing about protectionism today, and the world is talking about protectionism a lot, you cannot stop the flow of digital information. There's a lot of challenges being put to it, no successful blockages. So whatever happens in this space can happen in multiple countries very fast. And then the most important thing is a lot of this is driven by data. Data becomes king. Data is the new oil. Yes, I know we're in the Middle East. Yes, we know there's a lot of oil around us. But it's not necessarily going to be the driver of the economies going forward. So we need to understand how to harness these capabilities to be successful as corporates or as countries. If that's the case, we need to look at what these companies are really doing, what these countries are doing, what is digital. To me, digital is just three things. It's a mindset change. It's thinking about things in a very radical way. An example from a corporate world, when I think about digital services, I think about how not to offer a loan to a customer in days, but minutes. So you don't go from 10 days to 5 days to 7 days to 1 day. No, in one go, you do something which was taking 2 weeks in 1 minute. That's thinking differently. If you look at what is happening in the social sector, microfinance, financial inclusion. You talk about not adding a few thousand customers, you talk about adding a few billion, million customers. That's huge. So you have to think radical to be successful in the digital world. Second is that people, intellectual capital becomes much more important. So talent becomes critical, more critical than in the past. When you increase farm production and double the productivity in the farm, you could do it by adding pesticide and the number of people working on a farm. When you increase the production line to make a car, a plane, you could do it by adding the automation in the assembly line or, and with it, the number of assembly lines, the number of people working on the assembly line. In this world, that does not work. In this world, it can be one young kid sitting in a garage making a billion dollar company. Think of Jeff Bozo. Think of what happened this morning. The two people who created Instagram just left Facebook. They made a billion dollars from a little thing which you can tap, maybe. You just sent pictures, basically. And they left the company, and it was the headline news this morning on all the news channels. 
It's about people, talent. Talent is key in this world. And the last thing is risk-taking culture. Uh, this is a world of the unknown. I don't know how many of Star Trek fans, it's about the starship going, no way man has gone before. You have to do things which have not been done before. You have to look at things differently. You have to experiment and you have to learn to fail. If you fail, you will figure out why you failed and you'll do it better the next time. And that's a very different way of thinking about it. So I leave for you this thought that digital is not the physical attributes. Digital is not about resources of any type. It's simply about mindset change, talent, and restraining culture. And I think this is something which applies to companies and countries. So we have a lot of distinguished people here from the policy making functions of the various governments. And I just want to leave them with the idea of what the impact can be. There are various studies which have been done. And in public policy, there are three things which are very important for digital. How to maximize adoption, how to maximize the utilization, and the impact. And if you do this and you get this right, there will be an economic benefit from it. How much the economic benefit varies. How much the economic benefit is can be a number different by country. But I assure you, sir, the definition is there. The data is there to show economic benefit. There's a chart which was done last year by a university which shows the companies investing in technology, countries investing in technology tend to do higher GDP output. There's a study done, it's a little old. The data can be 30%, 50%, more than this or less than this. But clearly, you can have job creation and you can have an impact on GDP. So this stuff is real. It impacts all aspects of the economy, civil and defense. It adds to the strength of the country if you are able to make digital a power in your country, in your company. A new study was done just recently which shows for every 10% improvement in your digital score, you can get a approximately 1% improvement in your GDP growth. So with that thought, I leave you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. We heard an interesting talk by Mr. Uh, Sadir Mufti, and he told us that how the world is transforming in the digital age. I shall now call upon Major General Jafar, who is important, uh, who's commanding a very important division in Pakistan Army, to deliver his talk. He's going to speak on Pakistan counter-terrorism -terror strategy. On behalf of Pakistan Army, I am grateful to Sasi and the co-partner for providing me an opportunity uh, to share our experiences on Pakistan's counter-terrorism strategy, which Alhamdulillah has been a success story for us. Now, I have two major challenges uh, while delivering this talk. One, as per the instructions of General Samrays, I have to wind up the 17 years of success story in seven minutes. And the second challenge is uh, that I am addressing the audience amongst whom we have the architect of this strategy who are sitting here in different capacities now. While they were serving in Pakistan Army, they were the one who actually conceived and implemented this strategy while they are performing important tasks in general <coughs> assemblies who are sitting here. And it's really a challenge to present what they conceived and I'm doing it on their behalf as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as you all know that Pakistan became the frontline state after the 9-11. Not because of our own brain, but because of the environment which were imposed on us. And this is primarily attributed to the faulty strategies of USA which are adopted immediately after the Cold War. We faced the daunting challenges, but Alhamdulillah, we overcame this with a lot of success, but at the 
human and material cost which we paid and I am going to explain that to you subsequently. Immediately after 9-11, when the USA invaded Afghanistan, the terrorists which were placed in Afghanistan, they fled into Pakistan and the territory on the left side of the slide, if you see, this is known as federal registered tribal area. The size of this territory is approximately 27,000 square kilometer, which is equal to the size of the state of Israel. The red color depicts the areas which were under the control of terrorists and the yellow color shows the areas which were being contested strongly by Pakistan. And we were, in 2008, at the verge of being declared as failed state. We started off these operations and if on this slide you just pay attention uh, to the surge in terrorist activities from 2008 to 2011 and then there is a gradual decline. This is based on the strategy which we adopted. That I am going to speak later. But we paid a huge cost. It was around $123 billion. The casualties were around 90,000. The number of schools destroyed, the health facilities damaged, and the infrastructure which was damaged is also in thousands. But before I go on to the strategy itself, I'd like to explain the challenges which we came across while we were conceiving and implementing this strategy on ground. There was a lack of national consensus initially. We had the porous upon borders. The USA was cha frequently changing its policies and strategies inside Afghanistan. And at time, there was poor coordination between Pakistan Army and US forces inside Afghanistan. The geography and demography was posing a serious challenge to us. There was weak border management from the Afghanistan side. And we had continuous external interferences in the shape of proxies, besides why we were hosting and maintaining around 3 million Afghan refugees. How did we achieve this success? At the policy level, we came up with a dialogue, deter, and defeat, which was translated into a military strategy, which was clear, hold, build, and transfer. The military operations were acceptable to the public at large, and we were required to use minimum force for the minimum period of time. And there was a convergence of military and political component of the strategy. We had one national objective, and we remained consistent with that despite all odds, and that was defeat terrorism. And we defeated terrorism through whole of the nation and whole of the government's approach. With military lead and all organs of the states, including civil bureaucracy, law enforcement agencies, and people of Pakistan working in unison for one objective, which was to defeat terrorism. And Pakistan is one of those countries which actually synchronized the complete element of national power to achieve this sole objective. Ladies and gentlemen, now I just explained how did we strategize this on ground. We actually accomplished this through three different phases. From 2001 to 2007, we were into selective operations with emphasis on peace agreements which, had, which ultimately failed. And then we resorted to Phase 2, which was from 2008 to 2013, where we revised our campaign plans and conducted major clearance operations. The operations shown with the yellow arrows were the Phase 1, and the one with the red arrows are actually the Phase 2 operations. And after having done that, we went for the clearance of two main objective areas through Zerbiaz operations, which commenced in 2014, and it terminated in 2016 when cleared North and South Pakistan respectively. Having done that, we transited to Operation Nadir Fasad, which commenced in 2017. The aim was to have a stable, peaceful, and normalized Pakistan, where the terrorist freedom of action is sufficiently curtailed, and we consolidate our gains. Ladies and gentlemen, this strategy was people-owned and people-led. To avoid collateral damage in the troubled areas, which were to the size of Israel, just at the cost of repetition, we shifted this population to the settled area, and the people of Pakistan hosted that population for a considerable period of time. Having cleared that area, we resorted to winning hearts and minds, and uh, we again provided 
and effort to provide them the socioeconomic uplift. Just imagine 5 million population which has been extended communication, education, health, water supply, sports and technical training schemes to the tune of 769 projects and some of them are still in the progress. And those are the facilities which have helped uplifting the socioeconomic life of those people who were affected by the war themselves. Besides that, we are the only country which has defeated Al-Qaeda. Over 1,000 killed, 1,100 arrested, 1,000 repatriated, including 40 high-value targets. Besides that, we also defeated Tariqe Taliban in Pakistan by killing around 17,000, arresting around 4,000. And I, I, I can make a claim here that we resorted to an indiscriminate counter-terrorism strategy and we have no terrorist safe havens inside Pakistan anymore. However, because of the presence of Afghan refugees, there are sleeper cells uh, with which we are now handing through Operation Ladeh Fasad. Another astonishing figure which I am here to present, had we not carried out this operation, had we not cost the life paid uh, the life of almost 80,000 civilians, we would not have been able to recover the cache which is flashed in front of you. When we translate this cache into effect, it is to the tune of 32,000 improvised explosive device for 17 years in Pakistan at the rate of 5 IDs per day. And we have saved almost 100,000 casualties by clearing those areas and by recovering this huge cache. What is the effect? From 2013, the terrorist activities which were around 2000, it has come down to 56 only. Ladies and gentlemen, the process is still on. We are into the process of improving our border management. We have 2600 kilometers of a border. We have around 1000 posts against the Afghan army's posts which are around 200. We have completed fencing of around 300 km in our area despite casualties of 40 soldiers. The demands which were made on Pakistan, we have made those demands at the cost of our own security and well-being. We have fulfilled our side of the bargain. But much has to be done from the Afghan side. All those terrorists who have fled to Afghanistan, they are being provided local support and are exploited by the hostile agencies through proxies. Daesh is resurging in Afghanistan and it's not only creating problem for Afghanistan and Pakistan but it's a threat to the entire region as a whole. The Prime Minister of Pakistan has very clearly said that Pakistan will no more fight anyone else war. Our soil will not be used for terrorism. Pakistan, ladies and gentlemen, is at the unique cusp of history having surmounted the odds. It offers the brightest prospects for investment for achieving shared prosperity. I thank you all. Thank you very much, General Jafar. Ladies and gentlemen, I would say that I've been personally closely associated with counterterrorism effort of Pakistan Army. I've just finished writing my book, which is titled Post War on Terror Pakistan, which may be published in the next couple of months. I would like to make a mention that average time to quell such type of a menace word over is 22 years. Sri Lanka being an island country took 27 years to control this menace. And Alhamdulillah, Pakistan Army, Pakistan Armed Forces, Pakistan Nation has done it in 15 years. In spite of porous borders, in spite of having a perennial enemy on the eastern border. So I would say that successes of Pakistan Armed Forces and Pakistani Nation as well as sacrifices are unparalleled, unmatchable and unprecedented. With that, I will invite our next speaker, Dr. Zafar Jas Nawaz Jaspal, who is going to talk on another important subject that is hybrid warfare threat. <laughs> it's a great pleasure and honor for me to speak on a very important topic at this occasion. <coughs> and with this, I am very much thankful to Sasi and the panelists for inviting me 
five to six minute, I think. <clears throat> when we look about this crime transformation in the global politics, we are identifying that new kinds of the challenges, new kinds of strategies are emerging. It's an established fact that every age has its own problems, and we have to conceptualize them and contextualize them accordingly. Today, when we look about these kinds of things, we say the world is very much vulnerable, and especially states like Pakistan or Egypt are vulnerable to the hybrid warfare. It's a new term which was coined or immensely used by the Western analysts, especially after the annexure of the Crimea. But the Russians use the term neutral Russian warfare, or the Chinese say unrestricted warfare. But when we are looking about this, theoretically speaking, it's an attempt to create a battle out of battles. It's a way or a strategy to which you try to exploit the weakest organ of the state to use, or you can say, maximize your strength. It's the very simplest manner. When we look about it, we say it is an attempt to impose an actor's will on their opponents through integrated, adaptive, Asymmetric synchronized destructive effects on them in a multi-dimensional space and in a various spheres of life. Technology is making it very much easier. But when we look about these kind of things, we say there is a plethora of the terminologies to refer it. But what we can focus, there is a big shift. Generally, these kind of the wars, irregular wars, or these kind of tactics were employed by the weaker party against the stronger party. But today, a stronger party, or a sole superpower kind of a state, is using hybrid warfare against the weaker state. This is an important point or a shift which one has to take into account. And here I give you two examples from the Pakistan vulnerability. One example is, that when this China-Pakistan economic corridor started emerging, and today it is becoming a reality, what we have heard, Mike Fong, you said that IMF, if gives the, uh, you can say, bailout package to Pakistan, we have to monitor it, whether it's going to the IMF, this China-Pakistan economic buildup or not. So this kind of threat creates a problem that you can exploit the economic vulnerability. Similarly, when we look about the, at the regional level, our adversary on the one side say that we have to go for a dialogue. He uses an immense soft power image by blackmailing Pakistan, but at the same time, world should not forget the other mission which he was arrested in 2016. Similarly, at the most vulnerable aspect in the society today is your societal differences, fisheries. So the, through this internet, through social media, they try to pollute such kind of the, or you can say, uh, give the information and pollute the societal issues in a way that you become vulnerable to the adverse. In this context, when we see one is very interesting example that in 2030, Pakistan, while facing the energy crisis, went for nuclear power generation plants. The moment it crashed, the nuclear power plant was inaugurated. In a night, a mushrooming of the organizations or NGOs emerged with the fisheries rights, with the environmental rights, and with these kind of the rights. And from where the money was coming and the target was that they had to raise more and more concern to not check the Pakistani, but they had the Chinese entering the nuclear reactor market because they were producing the replica of Western Oil and Toshiba reactors. So that leads us to another important conclusion that today when we look about the areas, they are starting from the economic, cyber, civil, or ethnic, sectarian, every area is vulnerable. And if the nations have to chalk out this strategy to, uh, you can say, avoid these kind of threats, what is the best way? Generally say, oh, it's our forces, you can say responsibility. I agree that in a hybrid warfare strategy, you need the blending of the conventional and non-conventional strategies but, and the user of the armed forces. But at the same time, there's a need of integration of your people. There's a need of the awareness of the people. As we have just seen in the slide, that there were a different kind of policy. 
But I can say that on the one side there was a, you can say, military operation strategies are the other in case of Pakistan. There was other facade, but there was a national action plan. Without changing the narrative and awareness creation, you cannot face the new kind of the challenges which we see, non-canadic challenges, and having said this, what my suggestion or submission is that both kind of the state like uh, Pakistan or Egypt or other nations have to create some kind of what we call it hybrid warfare strategy and centers. They can share their experiences because today we have identical as well as contrasting challenges. Having said this, that we have to conceptualize and contextualize the hybrid warfare challenges more clearly and at the same time, the responses should be not only expected from the armed forces, but integration of the civilians and this kind of forces. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Just, Dr. Jaspal. You were right on time. Ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan Air Force played a pivotal role in counterterrorism operations. We have here an accomplished officer from Pakistan Air Force, Air Commodore Ghazanfar, who is going to talk about role of PF in counterterrorism operation. <coughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as already introduced by the moderator, General Summaries, basically I should focus on the role of air power in support of the law enforcement agencies and primarily the Pakistan Army. As we all know, the Middle East and Egypt has been the cradle of civilization. Similarly, Pakistan and its mountainous ranges have served as barriers between East and West. Both of our regions have been playground for great games between empires for a very long time. Post 9-11, the military operations by the US and the ISF forces against terrorist organizations and violent non-state actors in Afghanistan created multifaceted challenges for Pakistan. Due to Pakistan's geostrategic significance, foreign powers implied irregular warfare and use religious and ethnic extremism for creating fissures amongst state institutions and population. Main characteristics of these non-state actors were they were well resourced, trained to instill fear in the population. They would employ hit and run tactics, operate in small but multiple groups and melt in local population. Besides medium and small arms, they use improvised vehicle-borne IEDs and suicide bombings. They also employed information and cyber operations in support of their objectives. The VNSAs exploited Western fiber web wherein Pakistan Air Force was called in to support Pakistan Army to establish rid of the state. In a region where Russia and USA struggled Pakistan Air Force played a decisive role in the national victory against multi-pronged threat of terrorism. The most notable example in the modern air warfare. While ensuring national air defense, Pakistan Air Force simultaneously played an active role in counter-terrorism operations to fight against local and foreign terrorist outfits. However, PF soon realized that conventional approach with the legacy weapon systems had curtailed our liberty of action due to capability and capacity gaps. Major challenges for success of CT operations were legal and policy framework for political ownership, synergizing air power employment with strategy of LEAs, reactive targeting strategy initially against responsive and dynamic threat, command and control of air operations and over participating assets, special equipment shortfalls and personnel training. The mountainous terrain and unpredictable weather created targeting challenges. Due to these, during these operations, Pakistan Air Force 
did not transgress the boundaries set forth in the divine code of conduct, and we also call the law of armed conflict. That is the proportionate application of force and planned damage consideration with zero tolerance. Based on the study of environment and realistic situation assessment, PEF evolved a viable operational strategy with following key strands. National consensus created greater trust between state organs at policy and operation levels. As a strategy, PEF was employed in lead role during all operations to soften the terrorist resistance and break their will. Joint planning and conduct of operations including firepower coordination for targeting purposes, establishment of counter-terrorism directed air quarters for inter-services coordination, campaign planning, packaging, and part control. It also performed the additional role of remote JTAC or forward data control in the remote role through a network enabled environment. Proactive intelligence process was adopted for target development and engagement. Development of the ISR capability including tactical data parts, full motion payloads on board man unmanned systems and imagery analysis as its force multipliers. Precision night engagement capability to deny the terrorists the opportunity to regroup and reorganize. Engagement of high value targets in a time sensitive environment and dynamic or mobile targets to deny sanctuaries despite the demanding terrain. While ensuring secrecy, the party spreadings were screened, carefully selected, and trained for the conduct of CD operations. We're talking about the effect created by AIPAR, overall, Pakistan has achieved a strategic and military objective with rid of the state established, and the nation has the resort to fight the extremism. We have created following great threats by adopting superior and dynamic air strategy. The air power was instrumental in breaking the will of the terrorists, and the disease priority was achieved through reliable ISR means. And sure, zero avoid avoidable required damage by employing pristine guiding munitions and avoided threat site through meticulous coordination. Air power achieved surprise during day and night attacks with unpredictable timings and simultaneous engagement of multiple targets. Time sensitive targeting with efficient air target orders to strike your aircraft standing by on the ground. Dynamic targeting whereby targets not included in the air tasking order were tracked, identified, and cleared for engagement by air quarters in real time. Sanctuary due to night and bad weather, bad weather was denied through all weather systems and laser slash nursery guided munitions with integration of the real time ISR. I must acknowledge that EF could not have achieved these desired effects without conceptual clarity, moral strength, and stringent training standards. Based on the lessons learned, Pakistan Air Force has created Air Power Center of Excellence at EF Base Musaf, located at Sagwala. The constituent schools of ACE provide integrated training solutions for Air Power employment in conventional and irregular warfare. The counter terrorism Training modules include fighter operations, joint terminal attack controller, ISR courses, and imagery analysis, including weapon target matching, etc., to mention a few. The air power softened and cleared all areas prior to launch of ground operations is a testimony to the professional mastery of Pakistan Air Force. It dominated hostile forces in operational scenarios and achieved moral ascendancy, leading to paralysis of terrorist leadership. Achievement of PEF boosted the morale of our nation, the leadership and the ground troops. The Pakistani nation is committed to eliminate terrorism from our region and the world at large. In this commitment, Pakistan Air Force is ready and willing to share our hard-earned lessons with our Egyptian brethren through training, equipment and joint exercises. I thank you very much. Thank you, Gazanfar. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the counter-terrorism effort was a combined, uh, coordinated effort of Pakistan Air Force, Pakistan Army, and Pakistani nation, and also the architects of CT effort. Uh, and amongst them was Brigadier uh, Abed Mahmood, 
who is from Ministry of Defense, Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Let's hear from him a few other dimensions about our success story.
who were threatening the regional stabilities. Presently, there are no safe havens or sanctuaries of the terrorist organization in Pakistan. We have taken concrete steps to check cross-border movement. Ladies and gentlemen, on socio-economic front, special efforts have been initiated to create economic opportunities in those areas which remain neglected and where people were frustrated due to scarce resources and illiteracy. Hospitals, educational and technical institutions, communication infrastructure, and many other projects have been initiated in the tribal districts to change their approach towards life. Moreover, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is also likely to improve economic condition of lesser developed areas in Pakistan, especially the youth getting productively engaged. Sequel to military operation, a softer prong has also been launched, wherein various steps and reforms have been taken under CV counter violent extremism initiative. In order to make the world safer from the threat of violent extremism, religious scholars and ulama of Pakistan have issued a joint declaration. The declaration is an effort towards promoting concept of plural society, equal rights to every citizen, build peace and harmony within the communities, promote peaceful coexistence and tolerance. An unconditional fatwa has also been issued by them condemning all forms of violent extremism and terrorism, declaring armed struggle an act of sedition or rebellion against the state. It was also declared that the territory of Pakistan shall not and will not be allowed to be used for terrorist incidents elsewhere. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to pay a special thanks uh, to the Grand Mufti of Egypt and Sheikh Azhar for endorsing this uh, message of peace of Pakistan, uh, which is now known as the of Pakistan. It is in the shape of a fatwa and joint declaration. Ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan is collaborating with more than 80 countries on issues related to terrorism and extremism. We reiterate our commitment to fight and contribute positively in fighting the transnational threat of terrorism to foster regional and international peace and stability. Pakistan remains committed to fight against terrorism in all its forms and manifestations. We believe that terrorism is a global challenge and has to be tackled collectively through bilateral, multilateral cooperative mechanisms, leaving aside political aspirations for better future of our generation and particularly of those who have lived through the hell fire ignited and fueled by the manners of terror. I thank you all ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, uh, Brigadier Rabin Mahboud sir. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard a little about uh, Pakistan city effort and successes. We, have lucky, we are lucky to have with us uh, Colonel Hatem Sabet, who is from extra special forces uh, of Egyptian Armed Forces and I would like that we hear from him also on analysis of counter-terrorism in, Egypt, in Egyptian media. Over to Colonel Hatem. Assalamu alaikum. In the reality, the word I will say is not a word that is not a word, but it is a word that is a word that is a word that is a word that is a word مشاهدته من عرض رائع للتجربة الباكستانية في مجال مقاومة الإرهاب. يعني للتعقيب عن هذا العمل الرائع العظيم وددت أن أوضح للحاضرين أن التجربة المصرية تتقارب وتتشابه تماما مع أقدام عليه باكستان في حرب على الإرهاب. كانت مصر بعقد أحداث 25 يناير 2011 معرضة لشبه الانهيار التام والإجهاز على الدولة المصرية باستهداف قوات الشرطة ثم بعد ذلك محاولة التأثير على القضاء ثم بعد ذلك محاولة جر القوات المسلحة وصحبها إلى حرب أهلية مع الشعب المصري بغية تدمير الأمن القومي المصري باستغلال حالة الفوضى التي تم صناعتها بدقة خلال هذه الفترة كان لزامن على القوات المسلحة في هذا التوقيت 
أن تتوحد على قلب رجل واحد للحفاظ على الأمن القومي المصري وتم وضع خطة طويلة الأمد للحفاظ على تماسك الجبهة الداخلية المصرية عقب ثورة 30 يونيو 2013 هذه الثورة التي يتلاحم فيها الشعب المصري مع القوات المسلحة للإطاحة بنظام تم وضع خصيصا للإجهاز على الدولة المصرية تم وفود العديد من الإرهابيين والمقاتلين من كافة بقاع الأرض ومحاولة تمركزهم في مثلث رفح الشيخ زويل العريش في شمال سيناء وهي مساحة لا تتعدى 1.5% من مساحة شمال سيناء بالكامل هذه المجموعات صارت على ست خطوات أو مراحل هدم للدولة المصرية انتهجت في ست خطوات كما ذكرت الخطوة الأولى هو تجهيز مسرح العملات اللوجستيكي لمنطقة شمال سيناء وهذا بالفعل تم خلال استغلال حالة التهرب الأمني بعد 25 يناير وتم تجهيز شمال سيناء بأسلحة ومفرقعات وأجهزة ومعدات وأجهزة واتصالات حديثة جدا واردة من الخارج ثم بعد ذلك القيام الخطوة رقم اثنين هو القيام بإنشاء مجموعات إرهابية صغيرة هذه المجموعات الإرهابية الصغيرة كانت تقوم بعمليات ضد قوات وتمركزات الأمن لمحاولة جس النبض أو معرفة القدرة الحقيقية ثم انتقلت إلى المرحلة الثالثة لتنفيذ عمليات كبرى لإثبات القدرة والوجود ثم المرحلة الرابعة توحدت هذه المجموعات الصغيرة التي كانت تعمل بشكل شبه كامل أو دون مراقبات أو دون عمليات ردع إلى أن تتوحد على قلب راية واحدة لمحاولة التأثير على الأمن القومي المصري ثم انتقلوا بعد ذلك إلى المرحلة رقم خمسة وهي محاولة استقطاع جزء من الأرض ورفع العالم الأسود عليه ثم مفاوضة المجتمع الدولي باعتبار أنهم متمردين وليسوا إرهابيين ثم المرحلة السادسة كانت تبتغي إعلان قيام دولة المتمردين القوات المسلحة المصرية استطاعت بالتكاتف مع قوات الشرطة المصرية الضرب بيد من حديد على هذه التنظيمات واستطاعت من خلال العملية الشاملة سيناء 2018 التي بدأت منذ شهر فبراير الماضي وما زالت مستمرة حتى الآن قامت بعمليات بعمليات عسكرية بقوات أسلحة مشتركة سواء كانت قوات جوية أو قوات برية أو قوات دفاع أو قوات بحرية لمحاولة منع كافة الإمدادات التي كانت تصل إلى الإرهابيين وبالفعل نجحت في ذلك وتم تدمير البنية التحتية مع التركيز على القوات أو هجمات القوات الجوية التي كانت تستهدف أماكن وتمركز وتجمعات هذه التنظيمات الإرهابية يبقى الآن أن نعلم أن ملف مقاومة الإرهاب التي تولت القوات المسلحة قوات الشرطة الدفاع أو المسؤولية في الدفاع على الوطن عليه كان يلزمها تحرك سياسي قوي قاده السيد الرئيس عبد الفتاح السيسي عبر كافة المحافل الدولية واستطاعنا أن نمشي على بشكل متوازي في خطة تنمية سيناء مع خطة مكافحة الإرهاب يبقى لنا أن نعلم أن ما كانت تعانيه مصر من هذه العملات الإرهابية كان الغرض منه هو اسقاط الدولة المصرية عبر بعض الدول التي دعمت وما زالت تدعم هذه التنظيمات الإرهابية، ولا سيما أن مصر قدمت أدلة دامغة وقاطعة وفاصلة على تورط هذه الدول بعينها في دعم الحركات الإرهابية. يبقى الآن أن نعلم أن مصر الآن قطعت شوطاً كبيراً في القضاء على الإرهاب وتم تدمير البنية التحتية للتنظيمات المسلحة. أصدرت القوات المسلحة 27 بيان خلال الفترة السابقة تشرح في سير العمليات التي كانت هذه البيانات تأتي تباعا يوما بعد يوم إلى أن تباعدت هذه البيانات مما يشير إلى ضعف وعدم قدرة التنظيمات الإرهابية على مواجهة الهجمة التي قامت بها القوات المسلحة مدعومة بقوات الشرطة يبقى أن نعلم أنه بقي القليل أو القليل من الوقت لإعلان منطقة شمال سيناء خالية تماما من الإرهاب أشكركم لحسن الاستماع في أي أسئلة؟
questions towards the end. We can have questions towards the end. Yeah. yeah, please. Thank you very much. So nice of you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the problem that we faced in Pakistan was a combination of terrorism as well as law and order problem. We have an accomplished officer here from uh, Punjab Police, Mr. Akbar Nasser Khan, who's Chief Operating Officer, Project Director, Punjab Safe Cities. So we are going to hear from him, future of Punjab Police. Thank you very much, sir. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's a unique honor for me to represent Pakistan Police over here. As you have heard before, there was a war going on against terror and what lot has been done and we have those heroes, unsung heroes, not many people will know outside what they were doing but you have heard what they have done. In the meantime, what, in the meantime, what we were doing from Pakistan police was fighting with those terrorists in the urban areas and as you know, the war is not now limited to any one area. It knows no borders, no barriers. The Punjab Safe Cities Authority was an authority which was formed that how to digitalize our urban law enforcement infrastructure. It was not possible, it is not possible, it will not be possible, ladies and gentlemen, if we will not address and change our conventional methods of fighting against the bad with the same old techniques. My first speaker, Mr. Mufti, made my job easier by telling that what can be done and how we can transform and digitalize so many things in the private sector. But here is a, a little example that how we have done it in Lahore, which is a city of 11.1 million, and also in Islamabad, we have transformed our security sector. But trade security is a precondition. There are so many challenges which we can see, like emergency response, terrorism, any trader, any businessman who wants to come, he has to see all these things. However, what is important is the leadership, politics, environment, urbanization, political, all these issues are everywhere in all mega centers. What we have tried to address within our means that we address what is in the box. Our job is limited, we can do limited things, but for sure, that can affect the environment in a very positive manner. We have tried to address the things, as I said, in our limited scope, and we have tried to develop our city safe cities. By the end of next few years, Pakistan will have 21 cities which will have very modern infrastructure to address law and order issues. But not only that, we have developed the integrated emergency response center. This can be the first 911 of Pakistan or 999 or any other number. All emergency services are together and we are doing it. Because it is important for anybody who is visiting, for especially for trade, any other place, they need immediately help. Where they can find even as small as where they want to go, they want to know the way. It's not about all these emergencies, it is always also about the information. How they can do, what they can do. The second was the intelligent counter-terrorism. The days are gone when we can do with the human intelligence only. The human intelligence also needs technical input and who knows better than all of you and the people over here what the human intelligence has been supported by the technical input. And then we are also doing intelligent traffic management. We are very lucky to have very able partners like Huawei from China and other uh, friends who are working with us to regulate a city of 11.1 million and believe me, this traffic is as complicated as any other place, as Cairo, any other place. But we have started doing it. And this is a promise which will bring order in those cities where people are willing to invest, where traders want to come and see what kind of a city life is there. And then this is again a list is huge. And time is short, I can't dwell all in that. How we are doing it? We have some solution components. It's more about technology that we have developed a command and control center, sir, where all this information is at one point. All the relevant government agencies are under one roof, a whole as big as this, and they are working on their different parameters. They are trying to address the problems of the people. They are trying to be responsive as much uh, as possible. This morning on Facebook, I got a message. Somebody was showing his e-ticket. Oh, I was chalant. 
and I'm very happy. But I was still on yesterday and ticket came today to my home. For many people, it is not a new thing. For many westernized countries where the systems are already uh, planted, it is not new. But in a country like Pakistan, where we are on a digital transformation, and especially the public sector, it was a news. Somebody is happy that he was not stopped yesterday for a violation, but he is happy and willing to pay the money to go to bank or through online. And similarly, the video surveillance, all these things are done by wireless and wirelessly, which is a more technical component we will talk next. And how we are covering the city. Ladies and gentlemen, we have sensors across the city. There are different types of sensors. Sensors include cameras. They include people to public talk as well from the center. We can talk to people, they can talk back to us, and we provide them help. It's a major purpose is the public safety and order on the roads. Without making people comfortable, without making people easy, without giving them services, it is not possible to win their hearts and minds. And that is the basis of all cooperation and affinity with the state. And ladies and gentlemen, it was not possible alone. Police or any other organization cannot achieve results if they do not have partners from different society segments. We have public law enforcement agencies and media and criminal justice. Further actors were also part of it. It is a chain. This ticket has to go to someone to be paid. We have to transform our systems. We have to change our, and we have done it in the last three years. And again, communities, businesses, and academia are with us. I'm very proud that our National University of Science and Technology, our University of Engineering and Technology, our uh, Lahore University of Management and Sciences, and from abroad, Harvard University are working with us because, as the first speaker said, the data is there. We have the numbers. We can interpret, and we can use them well. I have two minutes left. I will take only one. And the philosophy is the only discipline, and the discipline of thought. And that's what we are trying to do, ladies and gentlemen. And that is what is here to offer. With Egypt, with the people of Egypt, with the different organizations, we are now ready to collaborate. We can offer our services. We can help to make our cities better together and make it safer for all the further investments and other collaborations. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Nasser. Ladies and gentlemen, our new government is laying a lo lot of emphasis on policing. And I'm sure by improvement in policing, we are going to consolidate our gains uh, that we have made in, uh, against terrorism. Just to substantiate the point, I would like to mention that the metropolitan city of Karachi, which is inhabited by 25 million people, the police force is made 30,000. So that, is a, that will signify how much effort is required in this area. Now, our next speaker, Mr. Haseeb, he is going to talk about Financial Action Task Force, which has been haunting Pakistan since some time. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. My name is Hasiba Rahman, and I'm an external fellow with SASI. I deal with corporate law and finance and would like to speak to you about the Financial Action Task Force, which is the FATF, and its anti-money laundering regime, as well as counter-terrorist finance. And I'll try to keep it brief, given that we're pressed for time. So, it may seem on a tangent, but the scope of the FATF's regime is certainly relevant to national financial security and by extension, successes relating to the BRI and CPEC, and particularly in light of the post-9-11 environment mentioned earlier. So the FATF, what is it? It's, it's an intergovernmental policy-making body that sets, assesses and monitors international standards to combat money laundering, terrorist finance, and more recently what they call proliferation financing. Given its international outreach and its effects on domestic policy, the FATF is not a treaty-based organization, which is surprising. And it was established, in fact, by the G7 in 1989. It is comprised of 35 countries that are roughly analogous to the OECD. 
and it reduces the regime standards to more than 180 jurisdictions through transnational anti-money laundering networks and regional FATF bodies such as the Asia Pacific Group or MENA FATF, of which Pakistan and Egypt are members respectively. So the FATF regime consists of various legal prescriptions under what's known as the AML CTF 40 plus 9 recommendations, which include customer due diligence and know your customer protocols for banks, which I'm sure you're quite familiar with. So money laundering, which is the issue which the FATF deal with, is a phenomenon which in the strictest sense of the concept is the introduction of proceeds of crime to the list economy in order to guise their origins and allow the perpetrators of crime to enjoy the spoils of their endeavours. In the context of the FATF's policy, however, the AML regime is linked to an entirely contingent of financial globalisation and international capital mobility. Alongside an attempt to prevent criminal activity, the interna internationalization and problemization of the AML can be seen, and it, it's indeed claimed to be a drive to achieve other unrelated public policy objectives, such as controlling illicit narcotics and arms trades and people trafficking and promoting national financial integrity. The AML regime is not actually in place to eliminate money laundering which is an end that wouldn't be compatible with the free movement of capital at all. But it's to exert a degree of control over the mobility of capital with a view to bolster public policy ends. So for the avoidance of doubt, money laundering is sometimes considered conceptually similar to tax management, avoidance or evasion, or to phenomena like offshoring, or the use of tax havens. Although they're similar, Money laundering is a crime unto itself, and its criminality is contingent upon predicate criminal offences that actually resulted in the illicit funds required to be laundered rather than the scope of any kind of civil liability. The FATF does not deal with tax, tax havens, or international tax competition, although it's been claimed that strong AML regimes result in healthier government revenue receipts, which is arguable. Counter-terrorist financing is, or terrorist financing, is superficially the opposite of money laundering, where the use of legitimate funds are pooled to commit an illegal act. And this has become more important since 9-11 and has been added to the FATF's policy and regime since then. So the measures that FATF take are along the lines of creating international duties I mentioned before that FATF is not a treaty-based organization and it doesn't create these duties in any conventional sense of the word and it really begs the question as to how the AML regime is actually promulgated and enforced. So initially what the FATF did is it took, you know, it invented what is known as the FATF blacklist which is now defunct. This is non-cooperative countries and territories and a decade ago this gave me way to a more voluntary mutual evaluation of countries which seek to conform to the FATF. Blacklisting stigmatize many emerging economies and can be correlated with capital flight and a reduction of FDI received by those jurisdictions and the threat of blacklisting forms a forum to normalize emerging economies adopting FATF AML standards. Upon such normalization and the loose mutualization of the IMF and the FATF, the newer system of mutual evaluation operates in tandem with local financial intelligence units, such as the MLCU in Egypt and the FNU in Pakistan, which cooperate with local law enforcement and financial institutions to promote FATF standards. Such FIUs themselves cooperate under the auspices of the ethnic group, of which Pakistan is currently not a member. So, we've moved away from blacklisting to graylisting, which seems to have been extended to include failures to comply fully with the FATF's CTF requirements, which include monitoring of informal money and credit operations, which I'm sure you can imagine is difficult and costly for emerging economies and their law enforcement resources. Generally speaking, the costs associated with investing in AML and CTF standards are felt disproportionately by non-OECD 
and emerging economies as their effects as are the effects of failures in compliance. The FATF and FPIUs provide no evidence that their policies are either effective or indeed cost effective, particularly for these emerging economies, from whose perspective AML may be their most expensive compliance cost. So in terms of recommendations to try and keep this short, uh, the actual volumes of illicit sums laundered through financial markets and emerging economies uh, is FATF style ANO policies tend to have very little effect on these, as the vast majority of significant laundering tends to occur in the OECD itself. This is not to suggest that domestic laundering doesn't occur. However, given the volumes of such laundering in proportion to domestic GDP and the proceeds of such laundering ultimately remain within the domestic economy, such activities do not pose a security risk to the financial markets of emerging economies. Emerging economies simply don't have the financial capacity to disguise significant money laundering in any, to any extent. So, the threat of money laundering in terms of national financial security of emerging economies comes in the leakage of forex from those economies, which tend to be challenged into the OECD and their more developed financial markets. Given, however, that in spite of democratic deficits in the FATF, its norms have become the globally accepted standard and emerging economies must find a middle ground between compliance with the FATF and protecting their national financial security. To allude to a point made yesterday, dealing with the slowdown in the economies of the FATF rule originating countries, AML and CTF can be seen as a form of leverage input by rule givers to emerging economies, including those in the BRI and CPEC. Rather than focus on the demands of rule givers and blind compliance, BRI and CPEC related AML and CTF policies should emerge as more dynamic and focus on the needs and outcomes of compliant countries in a manner which is conducive to their economic success and development. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Haseeb. Ladies and gentlemen, our last speaker is Dr. Shabana Fayaz, who is Associate Professor, Kaidazam University, Islamabad. She is going to talk about Pakistan counterterrorism policy and ongoing enterprise. Over to Dr. Shabana. Assalamu alaikum everybody. Uh, since I am the last speaker, I don't want to stand in between you and the team. Uh, but I would just like to flag a few points for our discussion today. Uh, I just put up two snapshots of the definition of counterterrorism as we have been discussing the Pakistan's policy of counterterrorism. Uh, what has been the flag points? I think the images speak more than the words. And uh, the two uh, pictures that are relevant to look into it, the first one is of the lecture being delivered at the uh, de-radicalization center set up by Pakistan Army in collaboration with a private NGO. And the other is the image of the forces fighting on war against the terrorists. So these are, in fact, the two facets of the Pakistan's counterterrorism initiative to Quebec. We have been engaged in the reformation, de-radicalization drive, and plus the kinetic operations that still continues in the form of the IPOs, intelligence-based operations, today, even today. I have given my talk as an ongoing enterprise. I believe Pakistan's counterterrorism policy is a mix of kinetic and the proactive measures. It is not a stagnant policy. It keeps on revising itself as the need and the time. And there is a synergy between the political elements and the, uh, the military elements and the kinetic parts of our country. So all we as have been said, we have traveled a lot of difference, distance from the pie time when we were not on one page, public was not on one page, as what is meant by terrorism in Pakistan. We were confused in the beginning that who, whose war we are fighting. But as the events unfolded and we recognized that this threat was not new to us, if we have been the victim of terrorism in different guises, whether in form of sectarianism or in the fallout of the Pakistan's contribution or the participation of Afghan Jihad and the flow of the non uh, 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 militants and the lot of armaments that came flooded into our country. 
So we have, I, I'm just skipping the slides, but they are available with the SASI, so you, uh, you can freely uh, have its distribution to your convenience. Uh, basically, we have been, going, but I'm going to speak on two parts today, as most of the parts have been covered, but I would like to flag there, I have been the whole legal regime has been constructed in Pakistan. We have traveled with the passage of the National Action Plan. We have traveled with the passage of the National Counterterrorism Authority that is known as the NAPTA that was dysfunctional in the earlier and it became very active in the fallout of APS attacks on Peshawar school in the last couple of years. And so we had our first national internal security policy being devised in 2014. This is a flat shot, uh, snapshot of the different kinetic operations. Uh, we have our soldiers and our armament sitting here who have directly participated and guided and, uh, and engineered the plots of these kinetic operations. And we are very uh, you, a nation that has come of an age in dealing with the kinetic operations. And the story does not finish with 2014. We have the present phase that is going on Pradul Fasa in the aftermath of Rahim Nija and Zabbi Azab, sorry, and then that is basically aimed at consolidating the gains made in the earlier operation under the leadership of General Rahim Sharif. This is a, just a snapshot of our uh, present army chief who has given, has said that we will be will not spare any terrorist and we will resolve all our energies to the benefit of the nation and eradicate the terrorism from the roots of the country. Political narrative on counter-terrorism, I believe, is a very important part. We cannot ignore it. This is a quotation to quote from the, our Prime Minister, that security operators is overstretched and exposed in the absence of a holistic counter-terrorism policy, with the under-equipped and under-trained police force is the greatest sufferer. This is a statement that was given by Prime Minister Imran Khan prior to his coming to the office. So as we know of today, that he has kept the office of the Interior Ministry with himself and the nation, so he is very keen to look into uh, uh, devising a holistic framework and working in synergy with all the branches of the, of the state to work a best solution for a Pakistan's counter-terrorism initiative. The, this is another sh snapshot since the political narrative does not stop with the government in power. This is another uh, quotation from the uh, Pakistan's People's Party uh, uh, head, former head. Uh, Mr. Asif Zardari, who was also the president, ex-president of Pakistan, he believed that the, he continues to People's Party, believed that defeating the ideology of terrorists is more than essential even today. And I think these words uh, uh, have the resonance with the present phase and the future phase as well. Uh, Ex-Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif was also committed to, the, uh, to rein in the tide of terrorism. And so is there another religious party, popular religious party in Pakistan, jamaat e islami who believes that Afghanistan and India are continuously interfering in Pakistan and resulting in the terrorist operations inside Pakistan. Cyber terrorism operations is a very key element that needs to be understood. Pakistan, as we, my colleague, Mr. Jaspal has rightly pointed out that hybrid warfare is the coin of today. So is the cyber terrorism operation and Pakistan is doing its best to keep pace with this threat. Madrasa reforms, I think this is an element that we can learn from Egypt a lot. Because as has been pointed out, although I didn't listen to whole of the speech because my mic came later on, uh, with the English transcript, but I understand that the Egypt has traveled a long way in eradicating the roots of terrorism that exist or extremism that exists within the society 
and sometimes the madrasas or the religious schools are believed to shelter and be an incubator of such ideas. In Pakistan, it is wrong to say that all madrasas are bad. They are not bad, but unfortunately, the, some of the terrorists have had the training in a sizable portion of madrasas who have been teaching a very one-sided version of an Islam. Uh, I would like to recall just to confuse that the Imran Khan Prime Minister of today, he has just said that why can't we have the engineers and the doctors coming out from madrasas, why can't we have them, why can't we redo our homework and this is the result of the Pakistan's government today and I believe I have the hope that there will be a better options for Pakistan and we will move forward. And then is the role of civil society as well. Uh, I would like to conclude with this that we, our policy framework is holistic in outlook. We have traveled off to 17 years where we are standing today, where the human security element of counterterrorism is very well understood by Pakistan. However, we need to do more homework on madrasas, on reforming our judicial system, on reforming civil enforcement agencies, on rehabilitating and reconstructive efforts, and harnessing the role of civil society, media, and counter-narrative to terrorism. Thank you a lot for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Shabana. Ladies and gentlemen, we had an exhaustive uh, session, nine speakers, and I'm sure that it was a bit dry also, so let me share something very light with you. Uh, my friends from Pakistan would know that Sassi Punnu is a folklore, a love story in Pakistan. Yesterday, one of the speakers pronounced Sassi as Sassi. So I really like that, and since then, I'm looking for a Punnu. So in the end, I would like to thank all the speakers for making wonderful uh, speeches and for adhering to the timings. And thank you to Sasi for providing us this opportunity. So nice of you. <laughs>